Hey, good afternoon, everyone from Washington, D.C. I'm Laura Verdun. I am a speech pathologist in private practice here uh, serving the Mid-Atlantic. I have had the honor to work with persons with multiple system atrophy my entire career, which now spans over 30 years. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all today and the MSA Coalition. I really appreciate the invitation to speak with you. Uh, there are uh, slides that I'm working from. You can take a picture of this QR code. I'll include it also again at the end of the presentation. This QR code, this QR code includes uh, a, a copy of the slides. So you don't have to take notes or take pictures, just take a picture of the QR code and it'll take you directly to the slides. I'm giving you just a moment to take that picture. A number of you submitted questions in advance. I will be addressing most of those questions as we go along. If you have additional questions, I've tried to anticipate what you might be interested in, but if you have additional questions, please share those in the Q&A uh, that may be available to you or not till later on in the presentation. I will uh, address those at the end of the presentation. I'm not going to be starting and stopping as we go along in an effort to keep things moving and in expectations that hopefully you've been able to address that. So for those of you who have just logged in, this is a QR code with the copy of the slides. So why are we here today? Uh, you probably don't need me to tell you, but why we're here is because there are problems with swallowing and with speech, which includes voice in multiple system atrophy. And this occurs more frequently in multiple system atrophy as compared with Parkinson's disease. And I bring up Parkinson's disease because it's more prevalent. People are more familiar. It's a common misdiagnosis. Why does this also matter? It matters because the changes in swallowing and speech and voice tend to develop early, are prevalent, and are more disabling in MSA as compared with Parkinson's disease. I want to lay out some of the challenges that, that your clinicians are facing. Yes, I appreciate that you are all facing challenges day in and day out, but, but your speech pathologist as well, including myself, are facing challenges. The challenges are with MSA that there's a lot more variability within patients as compared with Parkinson's disease. And I'm not even just talking about between the two variants, the Parkinsonian variant and the cerebellar variant. Uh, there's just a lot of variation. The majority of studies up until lately uh, have been conducted on Parkinson's disease. And there are things we can learn from that, but in this atypical Parkinson population, uh, there are just differences and differences that are of particular importance in regards to communication and swallowing. And as I alluded to earlier, sometimes in early stages, it's difficult to distinguish MSA from PSP, which is progressive supranuclear palsy, another atypical Parkinson syndrome and Parkinson's disease. It's not a matter of people not being smart enough to figure this out. Sometimes it takes time for the disease to reveal itself and, and make it clear as to really what is going on. Uh, as of late this past year, however, uh, the criteria for the diagnosis of multi multiple system atrophy has been refined, which is referenced here. And so hopefully that'll provide some additional clarity moving forward. The speech pathologists in your community may have limited expertise, particularly with the atypical Parkinson's syndromes, including multiple system atrophy. Parkinson's disease, again, is, is more common, and so there may be more familiarity, but there may not even be necessarily familiarity with movement disorder, so that's a real challenge. The other challenge is, as you know, is the, disease, is, uh, the disease progresses more rapidly, so it does make it difficult to gain clinical expertise, to do research, but as I alluded to earlier, there is more research now ongoing, more interest in the atypical Parkinson syndromes in speech and swallowing, the impacts and the disorders that are created, what are appropriate compensations and rehabilitative techniques. So what are my goals or the goals when you go in to see a speech pathologist? First is to aid in the diagnosis, early evaluation by a speech pathologist, particularly with attention to the changes in speech and voice, may help to reinforce uh, or refine or define the uh, movement disorder. 
the goal is to try to be as proactive uh, with the symptomatic treatment, uh, excuse me, be proactive with treatment in anticipation of changes, as well as to manage uh, the symptoms moving forward. We're, in a, we're making an effort to uh, maintain skills. It's a challenge to improve skills. So we wanna to try to maintain skills earlier on. Why? Because it helps to actually be more effective uh, and for a longer period of time. Our role, like I'm doing here today, is to provide education and support. Before we continue on with specific content, for any of you, those of you who have joined late, uh, at the end of the slides today, I do have a QR code, which will allow you to, uh, to secure a copy of the slides. So you don't have to be taking notes or taking pictures or, or you can just wait again for that QR code to come around. I started, started it with the, at the top of the talk. In multiple system atrophy, the index of suspicion for swallowing problems should be high, really at any course over the course of the disease. And this matters because uh, swallowing is important. You know, we enjoy meal times, it's social, and also it, it can result in further compromise to other aspects of our health and well being, which is what I'm going to talk about next. Dysphagia dysphagia is the medical term for difficulty swallowing. As I mentioned in multiple system atrophy, it is a major concern. There are problems with the ability to swallow safely, meaning the ability to protect the airway when we swallow. The airway is what goes down to the lungs. We wanna keep the airway clear so that things are going down the swallowing, the food tube passage. Reaction times can be slower. The swallow may not be as efficient, meaning material is left behind uh, or accumulates, and it takes a few extra swallows to try to, uh, to clear materials from the mouth or the throat. There are higher rates of pneumonia. The more severe the multiple system atrophy is, as well as there are higher rates of pneumonia in persons with MSAP, Parkinsonism versus cerebellar. Other considerations that are particularly important to swallowing are cough and breathing. Cough uh, impairment is called dystussia. And that may make, uh, you know, just why is cough a concern? Well, we want the cough to be strong and we want it to be effective, meaning to clear material out of the throat. And I use material to mean anything and also clear out any congestion from the chest. Any congestion, food, liquids that settles in the chest, there's a greater likelihood or the potential for developing a pneumonia. So cough and treatment of cough, which I'll come back to in a moment, is particularly important. There are studies that have been ongoing as of late looking at treating cough to improve swallowing, specifically in normals, persons with Parkinson's, MSA, and PSP. A particularly important note for persons with MSA is that in MSA, there is a tendency towards uh, impaired function of the vocal folds. The vocal folds can get to a point where they're not moving normally or they're not moving at all. And this is specific to MSA and not any of the other Parkinsonian syndromes. I bring this up because as you can imagine, it can interfere with breathing if the vocal folds are not able to open fully. It can interfere with swallowing if they're not able to close completely to be able to protect the airway. Also, if they can't close all the, all the way, then it interferes with the ability to project or to generate a strong voice. So if you have a sense that something is changing with the voice or with breathing, then having an ear or going to see an ear, nose and throat doctor to have them take a look and see how the vocal folds are functioning is particularly important. It's not clear uh, as to the nature of this impaired motion, whether it's an injury to a nerve, whether it's a movement disorder such as dystonia, uh, the, the jury's still out as to really what is going on with the vocal folds, but we do know that persons with MSA are at greater risk. You may hear, uh, uh, you may hear noise with breathing from the throat. I don't mean wheeze, like a wheeze from the chest, but you may hear noise from the throat and that's called strider. 
it can happen on exhalation too. It may happen on inhalation or exhalation or both. That is telling us that the vocal folds are, are perhaps in a closer position than they should be to interfering with the ease of breathing that may tell us that there's just too much tension. I, I saw somebody a week ago who doesn't have MSA or anything Parkinsonian. They just have trouble with their voice and they do this. They make that noise with inhalation at times. And they're also a singer and theirs is just because there's a lot of, they harbor and hold a lot of tension in their body. So that can be the case in MSA. That's not always, that, that's not often the case. So what are some signs of possible changes in swallowing? I have a nice exhaustive list here for you. Changes in speech articulation. Speech is just not as clear and precise as it used to be. The voice is getting softer. Why does that matter? As I mentioned earlier, the vocal folds are the last level of protection when you eat and drink. So if they're getting weak for voice, they also may be getting weak for swallowing and weak for cough. If you hear gurgliness or wetness with speaking, that can be a sign that secretions, phlegm, mucus is accumulating in the throat. Coughing more at meal times than at other times of the day. Not just cough, but coughing with meal times. Accumulated throat secretions, coughing with secretions and saliva. So maybe eating and drinking is okay, but they're having trouble with their saliva, their mucus, things like that. Choking on foods or pills. Sometimes people have trouble with one thing, but they don't have trouble with other things. So they may have trouble drinking water, but they actually drink all other liquids okay, or they drink foods okay. A lot of people who don't have MSA have trouble swallowing pills. Uh, and so if you always had trouble swallowing pills, that doesn't necessarily mean that's a red flag uh, because that can happen. We're looking for patterns of problems. Coughing with drinking, liquids going up behind the nose, that, that doesn't happen too often. Uh, drooling, taking longer just to manipulate things in the mouth, uh, you know, it, particularly things that are of more texture like red meats or crusty breads. Difficulty starting the swallow, meal times taking longer. And then I always ask a follow up question are meal times taking longer because of chewing and swallowing difficulties, or is it sort of motor problems, getting uh, food and liquids, you know, from the plate or the cup to the mouth? What's, what's contributing to the delay? Uh, diminished alertness at meal times, unexplained low-grade fever, and chest congestion. The problems we see most consistently in MSA, now this does, doesn't mean other things won't crop up, but the problems we see most commonly in MSA are difficulty sitting upright at meal times. There can be slouching forward, okay? Uh, and that matters because it can interfere with safety of swallowing, and it can also interfere with breathing and cough because we're just kind of collapsed in on ourselves. Holding food and liquid in the mouth, not on purpose, it just happens. Throat weakness, the throat becomes weaker, again, making it more difficult to propel things from the mouth through the throat down into the food tube. That also then can result in accumulation of secretions, you know, saliva and whatnot in the throat. We already talked about impaired mo uh, movement of the vocal folds, which are in your voice box right here, and then compromise of cough. What is silent aspiration? You'll hear this term, you know, with some frequency, silent aspiration. Aspiration means things going down the wrong way. We talked about a moment ago about things going down towards the lungs. Foods and liquids and saliva are designed to go down the food, the swallowing passage, not the breathing, talking passage. And uh, the challenge, actually the body's amazing in the first place that we all did okay for all these years in the first place. Uh, but the swallowing passage and the the uh, breathing passage are literally right next to one another. So it's amazing we all did okay in the first place. Uh, and so with just coordination or weakness of muscles, then things can start to go down the wrong way. It becomes silent aspiration when there's no outward sign that, there's a, that something's going down the wrong way. Things can sneak down and there's not a cough or there's not gurgliness or there's not even a <clears throat> sort of throat clear. That's silent aspiration. And that's indicative of, of things not moving as well as they should, but also not sensing or feeling things. It's not a matter of 
of you not paying attention. It's a matter of just the, the nerves have changed in the throat and they just don't feel things as well as they used to. So why are we concerned about aspiration? We're concerned about aspiration predominantly because of aspiration pneumonia. Aspiration pneumonia is an infection that develops in the lungs uh, because of things accumulating there. It can be just congestion that you can't clear. It can be food or liquids or pills or, or secretions that you're swallowing that end up in the lungs. The thing that's really important is that it turns out, and, and this has been reinforced over the years in research, is that having a swallowing problem in and of itself is not the greatest risk factor to, to developing aspiration pneumonia. The biggest risk factors are some of these other issues in the presence of a swallowing problem. Number one, poor oral hygiene. And if you think about it, this makes sense. So if your mouth is not so clean, if there's a lot of bacteria in your mouth and you swallow something and it accidentally goes the wrong way, even just a sip of water that goes the wrong way, then it takes that bacteria with it to the lungs. So we wanna keep the mouth clean with routine oral hygiene. It doesn't have to be anything fancy or complicated, but routine oral hygiene in an effort to keep the bacteria to a minimum, it's not going to make you swallow better, but at least if you swallow something that goes the wrong way, it'll be better tolerated by the lungs. Other things that really matter, cough impairment, and that makes sense if you think about it. And so we talked, I, I, I briefly alluded to using cough as a, uh, as a, a focus of treatment, I'll come back to that in a moment. Limited mobility, working with physical therapy, you know, and chest physical therapy in an effort to optimize mobility as best as possible. Any movement just helps keep things from settling in the lungs. And then dependence on others for meal times. Uh, when we're dependent on others for meal times, then we're dependent upon them to present foods or liquids and, and the speed with which they present, and that can throw off the coordination and safety of swallowing. So what can be done? So I've raised these issues and you're probably saying, okay, I know these are issues, but what are we going to do about it? So here are some suggestions. They're not exhaustive, but they're a place to start. Definitely there should be some mealtime observation and supervision, looking for patterns. What seems to be the problem? If you have trouble with something once, I don't, I don't get concerned about that. What I'm looking for are patterns of problems. Uh, is it only with liquids? Is it only liquids drinking from a cup versus a straw? Is it only water? Is it uh, um, hot liquids versus cold liquids? Is it specific food items, whatever? I'm always looking for patterns that helps me to help you, but it also helps me to anticipate where, where some of the problems might lie. We want to optimize posture. As I said, there's a tendency towards the body slouching. And so we want to keep people upright. And I realize you could say, Laura, that's easier said than done. I understand that. Okay. Uh, one thing I've done with other persons with MSA who are having trouble staying upright is I'll have them put on a button up, a fully buttoned up shirt that's maybe a size or two too big. And I don't have one here today to show you, but a size or two too big, and then put the shirt on, but drape, not drape it, but position it over the back of the chair. So that keeps them upright. They still have use of their arms and you can button up a few buttons. It doesn't have to be fully buttoned up, but it keeps them then secured to the chair, which keeps them upright. Being in an upright, neutral head and neck position like this is always going to be a safer swallowing position. Talk with a physical therapist or an occupational therapist to provide additional guidance on, uh, on positioning challenges. We want people to be alert as best as possible. The less alert you are or someone is, the likelihood there is going to be more trouble with swallowing. Clear the secretions out of the way, whether it's actually spitting them out, whether it's using a suction machine, suck portable. There are portable suction machines, which can just be plugged in. Uh, that's part of durable medical equipment. You can just get a prescription from your physician for that. Uh, you can use a suction machine and those are, are very useful. They don't have to be used nonstop, but just like at the start of a meal, just to clear out any accumulated secretions. In general, the goal is slower intake, slower sips, excuse me, slower, smaller sips versus chug-a-lug. Uh, 
you know, one bite at a time types of things versus sort of, you know, shoveling things in, taking big mouthfuls and, and, or, or rushing the slower you go. I don't mean excessively slow, but the slower you go, the more likely you're able to control the situation, whether you're eating by yourself, whether someone is providing assistance. I alluded to this at the top of the slide. We want to maintain a list looking for patterns of what are the foods or liquids that are giving people trouble. When people come in to see me, that's what I ask. Well, what's the problem? And it has to be more than, oh, I'm just having trouble swallowing. And what's, what's giving you trouble? Do we want to avoid foods or liquids? You know, there may be some things that outright need to be avoided, but my preference really moving forward is always to try to look for modifications, adjustments. Examples I provided here are, you know, foods that are overcooked. I'm not suggesting undercooking foods, but, uh, you know, chicken breast that's overcooked, it's just going to be harder to swallow than chicken breast that's cooked properly. Uh, dark meat chicken is generally easier to swallow than white meat chicken. Chicken within a casserole is easier to swallow than it is just a boneless, skinless chicken breast sitting right there. Use of condiments, gravy, sauces, anything that promotes lubrication helps with the manipulation and ease of swallowing. Uh, obviously, we can't do this here today together, but I do encourage everybody who comes in, I make sure that they know how their care partners know how to perform the Heimlich maneuver. If you do not, uh, and you have a family member who knows how, ask them to show you, ask your physician, a nurse, speech pathologist, somebody to provide you guidance on how to perform that should there be a choking event. People often ask about thickeners. Thickeners, you can see some examples here. I'm not promoting any of these. Thickeners can take the form of a powder or a gel. They can be uh, also pre-thickened. So the ones on the bottom right are pre-thickened products uh, and they come in different thick thicknesses like nectar consistency or honey consistency, just as an example. I do not, um, I don't encourage these outright. There are concerns about thickeners. The biggest concerns are they may not be tolerated well by the lungs should they be aspirated, and they may actually reduce overall liquid intake. Why? Because people would rather have a glass of water than a glass of thickened water, just for example. So it's worth discussing this with your care team. The reason thickeners are used are just to slow transit. You know, water, so as I take a sip of water, water moves really fast. Iced tea moves really fast. Coffee moves really fast. That's why thickeners are used to slow down the transit to give the throat and the airway a chance to be better prepared. So talk to your care team about those. A swallowing test. So uh, when you meet a speech pathologist such as myself, I often observe you eating or drinking a few different things. But sometimes we also then need to proceed with additional testing, and that's called a swallowing test or a swallowing x-ray. Not everybody has to do this, but it's essentially a video x-ray while you eat and drink different things. You're seated or standing. There's a camera off to the side or in front. They give you different things to eat and drink. Most facilities, uh, their outpatient radiology facilities, have a protocol that they follow the whole point of the swallowing test is one is to document present level of function, what's working, what's not. Number two is, is there a potential for aspiration or not? And number three is if there are problems, essentially, what are we going to do about it? What sort of strategies or exercises can we implement to help you move forward with your swallowing concerns? The biggest issue, and this actually arose also in one of the questions that was raised, I feel very strongly about this, is that the swallowing study needs to, as best as possible, replicate the home environment. So the standard protocol in these facilities is you know, very straightforward, but it's a lot of small sips and it's a lot of small bites and it might be pudding or yogurt or a cookie. Well, those may be things you either don't eat or they also may be things that aren't, you don't have trouble with. So um, the, uh, the, the barium products, so there are all these white products, they don't taste bad, but they may not be consistent with the consistency of foods you normally eat. So I encourage people always to take a couple of food items along with them. One of the first patients I ever saw when I first started practicing solely had problems with shrimp and peanuts. Well, they're not gonna have shrimp and peanuts in the hospital. Not that you want shrimp necessarily from a hospital, but uh, they, 
uh, they, they had trouble just with shrimp and peanuts. So it was that texture that was difficult to them. So I just had them bring shrimp and peanuts to the test so that we could test it out. You're not bringing out a whole buffet of items with you, but you know, it could be your turkey sandwich. Uh, somebody last week, it was their cereal bar, you know, whatever, one or two items so that those can be tested as well, number one. Number two is somebody asked, and I'm jumping ahead, but asked about liquids that the test is, actually I'll wait, I'll leave that to the next one. So bring along food items or liquid items so that you can be tested and the results are are as consistent as possible with your, uh, your challenges. So when should you have a swallowing test? Again, not everybody necessarily needs a swallowing test. Uh, it's rare that then somebody needs multiple swallowing tests. But the swallowing test is recommended if, if the swallowing strategies we've tried out or the exercises just don't seem to be working. Uh, if it seems like there are multiple problems going on. I had a gentleman uh, earlier in July who has uh, Parkinson's disease, but the symptoms that he was having, uh, the swallowing, he was having swallowing problems, which is not a surprise with Parkinson's, but what he was describing and what I was observing with him were not consistent with what I would expect with Parkinson's disease. It seemed like something else was going on. So he definitely needed a swallowing test. If you are receiving Botox, botulinum toxin for dystonia, for, you know, tight muscles or for salivary or for saliva management, then a swallowing test should be done first. As an aside, I was talking about the video x-ray. So the VFSS, the video fluoroscopic swallowing study. So that's with the camera off to the side or in front of you. Sometimes facilities also provide a fiber optic swallowing test. Uh, which is their sort of image up here on the top right corner. And that's where they use a flexible naso endoscope to go through your nose to image your throat. Uh, it's not that you should not have that. To me, in my experience, that exam for this population is limited. And it's limited because of postural issues and maybe other movements. It's easier to get better imaging, more reliable imaging with the video fluoroscopic swallowing study. Sorry about that. So should we try swallowing therapy? Consult with a speech pathologist. The last slide today is about how do you find a speech pathologist? The whole point is to tailor therapy, a therapy program specifically to your strengths and deficits. It really breaks down into two scenarios. One is compensatory strategies, like just the example I gave earlier about sitting up straight. That's a compensatory strategy. That's not therapy, but it can include uh, changes in utensils, texture modifications. I alluded to that earlier. Uh, sensory enhancements. That would be something like drinking iced cold beverages versus hot. Sometimes that matters, but you don't know until you try. Uh, strategies on how to more readily, easily take medications. And then swallowing exercises. Swallowing exercises are essentially a physical therapy routine exercises to strengthen, improve timing, the coordination, the range of movement of the swallowing muscles. So from the mouth through the throat, as well as improve airway protection. Again, how well those vocal folds are closing to promote ease and safety of swallowing, promote cough and endurance. So let's talk about cough. Cough is really important, as I mentioned, in any of the, any neurodegenerative disease. It's particularly important in MSA. Why? We want to keep the airway clear. We want to promote swallowing, or excuse me, safety and strength and ease of swallowing. Uh, so there is a technique, and I'm not going to get more specific than this, but I want to bring it up because this may be relevant to you, and you can talk to your speech pathologist about this. Uh, there have been studies done, uh, completed more recently, on the use of respiratory muscle strength training. So this is breathing muscle strength training. And these, uh, these exercises can be targeted towards the muscles that exhale, breathe out, or the, mark, or the muscles that inhale. They're designed to improve cough, swallow, voice, and breath support. And they've actually done studies looking at normals, the elderly, 
uh, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and multiple system atrophy. There are a number of devices on the market. The most commonly used devices, are the, or the ones I most commonly use, uh, I have highlighted here. So one is the EMST-75. It's an expiratory device. You see a picture of it here on the screen. It's a green one. So mine's blue because it's, this is a 150. This one is, uh, has more resistance. It's more work. Uh, the breather, which is white, there's also a black one. The black one is more resistance, meaning you have to work harder. These devices have valves in them. So these are different than if you've ever been in the hospital and you get an incentive spirometer. It's that device where they have you, it's a you know, plastic device and it has a little yellow ball in it. And they have you do inhalations to try to expand your lungs in an effort to keep things from settling in your lungs. So you can use that, but the limitation with that is it's not so much work. Whereas a device like this has a valve in it that forces you. So I don't know if you could hear that. I'll do it one more time. That forces you to work either. I'm exhaling against this to exhale against resistance or, or sorry, not my nose to inhale through resistance. It makes the breathing muscles work harder. Why does this matter? Because we want the breathing muscles to work harder, to generate a better cough. It also turns out it enhances some of the activation of the throat muscles as well. These devices require, you should get medical clearance. They are readily available on the internet. They are not, uh, you know, they're non-prescription, but you should get medical clearance. You shouldn't be trying this on your own. Talk to your doctor, talk to your speech pathologist, but these are a nifty thing. There's a very straightforward protocol that you do most days of the week. Uh, and it's, it's just very easy to follow through. I can't reinforce enough the importance of addressing cough. So this is, you know, this is a challenging part of the conversation today is talking about feeding tubes and nutrition, but I felt compelled to include this uh, because it's something people don't know how to bring up or, or they don't feel comfortable talking about it or, you know, you know and understandably so. But I felt like uh, if we could at least initiate or extend the conversation that this would be really valuable. So do you need a feeding tube? A feeding tube is used to provide hydration, meaning fluid, liquids, or to provide nutrition or medications via a tube usually placed directly into the stomach. In, uh, in, it can be in addition to eating and drinking by the mouth or maybe instead of. So there, there can be transition periods. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. So how do you know? Well, these are just a few of the questions considered. This is not exhaustive, but it's at least a place to get you started. How much time and effort does it take to eat and drink throughout the day? Are you spending more time eating and drinking or trying to eat and drink than you are doing other things? Is eating and drinking in and of itself exhausting? The more exhausted you get, the more the the less safe swallowing will be. Less safe swallowing will be. The more time you spend on eating and drinking, the more calories you're actually burning trying to eat and drink. What is the level of distress with continued eating and drinking by mouth? Does eating lead to fatigue? I just mentioned that. Do meal times take longer than an hour? I'll be honest, the hour time frame is arbitrary, but those who are eating for longer periods than that need to consider going to more frequent smaller meals. Again, in an effort to minimize fatigue effects in an effort to reduce the amount of calories that are burned that you're trying to actually get in. Does the swallowing impairment outweigh other deficits? If swallowing is the worst thing, but everything else is going actually pretty well, that's something to consider. Is there noticeable weight loss, malnutrition, and dehydration? Is level of consciousness interfering with oral intake? I suggest, and this is my professional bias, I will own it. I suggest that discussions regarding feeding tube options should take place sooner rather than later prior to any sort of health crisis. Once a health crisis arises, then your opportunity to make a choice that works for you becomes greatly limited prior to a health crisis. And it should be repeated often because perhaps your circumstance changes, perhaps your opinion, your beliefs change. It's difficult. Decisions must revolve around an assessment of burdens and benefits. 
It requires value judgments, consideration of quality of life. We do know that at this time, there is no evidence to, uh, to support improved survival or quality of life with feeding tube placement in MSA. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It's just part of the considerations. The patient and family should agree in advance with a physician about what is hoped to be accomplished with or without placement of a feeding tube. So I really encourage you to have these discussions. I know they're hard, but they're incredibly important. Whatever decision you make is the decision that's best for you. So what are some of the questions people asked about swallowing? Why do swallowing studies seem to be useless? They choke whenever they drink, but swallowing studies show nothing is wrong. This gets back to my point earlier is that the swallowing study needs to replicate the home feeding environment. So uh, take a cup with you. If, this, if, you're, uh, if your loved one uh, only drinks from a coffee cup, take the coffee cup with them. Maybe they're using something different during the swallowing test. Uh, if they're drinking by straws, we'll take straws with you. If they are, if they chug a lug, well, at home, then they need to be chug a lugging during the swallowing test. The swallowing test only proves that for those few moments in time, whatever the presentation and delivery was, that they can do well. We want to try to replicate the home environment during the swallowing study so it will reveal, not to make people miserable, but to reveal the challenges so we can address them more effectively. They're having more trouble swallowing and it takes up to three hours to eat a meal. I just mentioned that three hours to a meal seems incredibly exhaustive and incredibly challenging. I would look at different ways to approach that, either with use of nutritional supplements to push additional calories, you know, fats and proteins and things like that uh, by mouth, uh, looking at simpler foods and liquids to consume, uh, going to three hour intervals versus one three hour interval. So I would look to try to troubleshoot to manage that more effectively. How to best handle sticky clear secretions, which are hard to spit out. That's exactly right. When things are sticky uh, in the mouth, they're hard to swallow. They're hard to spit out. It also makes everything else harder to swallow. So I would look at first really their hydration status. When they have their next uh, medical appointment, uh, you know, they may have labs drawn and we're looking for any signs of, of dehydration overall throughout the entire system. Uh, the second is other things that can be tried. Uh, I mentioned earlier about a suction machine, but a suction machine has trouble getting rid of the, the sticky clear secretions. You can use something manual, like just using a wet, uh, a wet washcloth because that'll have a little more texture, can be a little bit more abrasive. I've had people try uh, something carbonated, something carbonated such as club soda or sparkling water. I don't routinely recommend you know, Diet Coke or Pepsi or something like that, but if that's what you have, fine. The reason being is sometimes the carbonation may help break up the, the sticky thick secretions, whereas you find you try to drink water and the water just slides over it. I'm looking for something that will break that up more effectively. I would also then look at their oral hygiene routine. There's often too much saliva to move food through the mouth, making it difficult to swallow. Uh, so two things about this. One was the suction machine we talked about. The second is I alluded to, but didn't say directly is this is worth talking to your doctor about to see if two things, one, are there medications that can be used to address the situation? You have two choices, medications to dry up the secretions, but then you end up in the problem that the person before has because it makes them thick and viscous, or try to thin out the secretion. So things like mucinex, and I'm not saying you should take mucinex, you need to talk to your doctor, but things like mucinex, regular, are designed to thin the secretion. So sometimes, and they don't generate more secretions, they just thin it out. So they're easier to drain through. That's point number one. Number two is Botox is used, the botulinum toxin is sometimes used and injected into the salivary glands to minimize the production of saliva. So it's worth talking to your doctor about that. How can you help someone to drink more to avoid urinary tract infections when they're having difficulty swallowing liquids? This is really problematic. Uh, this requires some troubleshooting for sure. We talked about thickening liquids uh, and the concerns about that, but, but that is potentially an option. You need to take that up with your, your medical providers. Uh, you can look at other things such as jello products, look at wet fruits, uh, melons, like for right now, watermelons and cantaloupes 
are are particularly are obviously in season or at least well I shouldn't say obviously in the mid Atlantic they're in in season, and so wet fruits can be effective. Papaya uh, is a nice juicy fruit. I don't routinely recommend citrus fruits particularly if you're having trouble with reflux, like acid problems, you know, that may not be MSA related, just something else, but that may promote that. Uh, and so we're looking for other foods or liquids that can promote hydration without, um, to address the issue of, of the UTIs. So let's talk about speech and voice a little bit. Uh, the speech and voice changes do vary between MSA P and MSA C, and they also may vary somewhat even just within those subtypes. Uh, I'm not going to get into those specific features, but the point being is when you you know you meet somebody else who has MSA P, they they may actually sound or have different speaking challenges than than you have. We talked about some other medical terms earlier. I wanted to highlight a couple now. Ataxia, ataxia, you can have ataxia that affects any aspect of your body, but it can also affect speech. Uh, it, speech can be ataxic and it essentially is a discoordinated speech. It may sound um, drunken in nature as if somebody's consumed too much alcohol just because of the irregularity of the, of the quality of speech. And then there's dysarthria. Dysarthria is just a motor speech disorder and it's an ataxic, you can have ataxic dysarthria, uh, but dysarthria is also change in speech where you have consistent errors, whereas ataxia is inconsistent. Uh, consistent errors because of weakness or slowness of movements and difficulty coordinating muscles. The important thing here is, is two things. One, we'll talk about therapy in a second, but uh, early speech evaluation really at any point in time, but early speech evaluation may actually help distinguish MSA from Parkinson's disease. And that's really what we're really trying to pursue and encourage early referrals. Uh, cognitive changes don't tend to occur as often in MSA versus something like PSP, where cognitive changes are, are much more likely to occur. That doesn't mean it can't happen, but it tends to develop later on and it tends to be milder. So uh, is there value in speech therapy? What are some options available to you? My priority always in working with persons with MSA is looking at functional communication effectiveness, is looking at the overall picture. It's not just, can you say this ah uh, better? It's about looking at communication as a whole. What do you need? What do you need to be able to communicate? And working with your care partners as well, because they're part of the whole process. So we need to look at the big picture. We're trying to promote use of residual function and compensate for impairment. And this takes a couple of different approaches. One is focusing on the speaker, and I'll give you some examples in a second. So the speaker, the person with MSA, and the first and really simplest way to approach this, approach this is focusing on clear speech, whether it's reading aloud, whether it's speaking, you know, common daily phrases, things like that, is focusing solely on speaking clearly. And when you tell people to speak clearly, take a breath, speak clear, people tend to move their mouths a little bit better, tend to speak with a little bit stronger voice. Of course, it takes practice, but that's, you know, that's where we start. There also need to be communication-oriented efforts where the listener, the participant, also is included. And uh, that seems obvious, but that doesn't always happen. <laughs> so I encourage people to bring their you know, their partners or whoever's involved in their care with them. Uh, why? So we can, again, try to promote communication effectiveness as, as best as possible. When I see somebody for the first time, I'm always doing stimulability testing. That means whatever the concern is, whatever strategy or therapy technique I'm trying, I am looking for, are you stimulable? Can you do something different? Can your mouth, your throat, your voice, your swallowing, can you do something different than you came in with to see me today? Because that will give me an indication as to whether or not it's a good idea to proceed with voice therapy if it's going to be of value. How can I improve my voice? We talked earlier about that the vocal folds can weaken in MSA. And this is a common complaint with people who have MSA is that their voice just isn't as strong as it used to be. I'm intentionally distinguishing between voice, meaning the sound, 
uh, and speech. Speech meaning how, uh, the sounds that you speak, the precision, the pronunciation, how you move your lips and your tongue. So how can you improve your voice? Well, this also applies to speaking. It turns out <laughs> you cannot expect your voice or your speech to be better if you're not actually using your voice or speech. So I encourage people to increase their voice use and to continue using their voice. This is not a situation where there needs to be more rest. It's not that you've been overdoing it, yelling and screaming or you know, going to clubs or smoking or things like that that may irritate the voice. The issue is one of ultimately deconditioning weakness, the nerves just not working as well as they could. If you do nothing else and come away with nothing else from today, <clears throat> use your voice. It could be reciting prayers or poems or passages It could or lyrics. It could be reading aloud. I'll have people read aloud titles to newspaper articles or read aloud the first paragraph of an article or maybe a paragraph just from a book chapter, anything like that. It's not that you have to converse with people more, but you have to identify opportunities where you can practice more. There are a few other strategies, script training, the basis of script training, and you can work with your speech pathologist on this, but is to define what are the things you most often need to say? What are the most important things you need to say and practice those? If uh, I have a dog named Hank, okay, so if you don't have a dog named Hank, then you don't need to be practicing, you know, uh, anything related to my dog named Hank. You need to focus on whatever your dog's name is, or you need, you don't have a dog, but focus on other things related to mealtimes, um, needing to go to the bathroom, needing to, uh, looking for your reading glasses, whatever, coming up with a list of things that you often say that need to be said clearly. Communication circles. Communication circles is about recruiting other persons in your world to participate in communicating with you. Why? So you just have the opportunity to practice. That could be anybody within any community, your neighborhood, your church, family and friends, prior co-workers, whatever, but engaging them in your circle in an effort to provide an opportunity, uh, provide a supportive opportunity for you to speak. Singing. Singing has actually been studied in Parkinson's disease and has been found to be very valuable. If you enjoy singing, then do some singing. The advantage to singing is it's essentially cross-training for your voice because it forces you to make your voice change pitch and loudness. Uh, it, it just makes it, and also sometimes it's a little bit more fun if you like to sing. As I alluded to at the start of the speech slides, therapy needs to focus on all aspects of communication, not just speech drills. So you might get better at saying, ah, uh, or ta 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 Okay, fine. But I am always working towards how will this make it easier, better, more effective for you to communicate. That's what you should expect for yourself during your speech and voice therapy. I wanna highlight just a few programs. I'm not going to spend any time on these, but I want you to be aware that they exist. Uh, LSVT Loud is a prog program that was initially developed for persons with Parkinson's disease. They have done some limited, very limited studies. Uh, this program is likely of more benefit in persons with MSAP versus C. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try it otherwise. I'm just giving you a heads up that this program exists. The Parkinson Voice Project Speak Out is a similar program. Their emphasis is really on group training versus individual training. Forte Phonation Resistance Training Exercises is a program that was developed for people with aging voice. Uh, and uh, definitely there's a role for telehealth. Therapy services uh, can be provided by telehealth. They need to be provided by a clinic, uh, excuse me, the, the speech pathologist needs to be licensed where you reside or wherever you are physically present. So for example, I'm licensed in DC and Virginia. I need to see people only in DC and Virginia. If somebody from Maryland wants to see me, they have to come, come physically see me because I'm not licensed in Maryland. And this just broke last week. Medicare has approved telehealth uh, coverage through the end of 2024. Uh, there will be times when you feel as if uh, speaking uh, is a particular challenge or therapy is not available or you're not interested in therapy or you're just looking for other options. 
this is when we talk about assistive communication. Assistive communication or augmentative communication can take many forms. Uh, we pursue these usually when speech is not meeting uh, our daily needs. It can take multiple forms from something very simple and basic uh, to something more complex and technologically advanced. It could be, and you, you can work with your speech pathologist on this, developing a, developing a communication board. It could be something like just a, a list of letters. It could be uh, most common words. It could be pictures, things like that. It's highly varied. It's highly personalized. For people who have trouble with their voice, if speech is reasonably clear, but the voice is weak, a personal voice amplifier, the voice amplifier will only make the voice louder. It does not make speech clearer. But if you look, look on you know, Amazon or on the internet and search personal voice amplifier, there are so many that are available. Look at the reviews. Uh, there are many that are inexpensive. There are medical grade amplifiers that run you know, a few hundred dollars, but for most people, those aren't necessary. Uh, there are technology-based communication systems called speech generating devices. You have access to those through a speech pathologist who specializes in speech generating devices. You would need a referral for that. Uh, and as you move forward, and what, and what I'm looking for is not only what works, but is being able to, to access the device easily. So we want to take into consideration any vision changes, ability to, to uh, manipulate it motorically, any cognitive changes, uh, that may interfere with ability to access and, and utilize these devices effectively. People are often interested in apps for the phone, for tablets. Here's a list. There are so many more. I'm not promoting one over another. I just wanted to give you some examples of what's available. Suggestions for care partners, again, because they're participating in communication with you, uh, keep comments and questions brief. And it really should be one comment or one question at a time. If you list off two or three, at, two or three things at a time, it just makes the, the, the conversation much more complex and, and harder to move forward. Stick with topics which are familiar. So if you haven't been talking about... Um, I don't know, the Barbie movie. I was just trying to think of something current. If you haven't been talking about that or if that's of no interest to them, and then all of a sudden you bring that up, well, that's going to bring conversation to a screeching halt. One topic at a time, directed yes or no questions. Uh, would you like a glass of iced tea? You know, yes or no, okay? Or it could be a choice, like on the last one. Would you like iced tea or water? Okay. A choice or a specific ask versus what would you like to drink? That just leaves it too open-ended and it can make it uh, difficult to be able to interpret. Don't hesitate to ask for clarification. Did you say? It helps just to enhance the communication experience. So what are some of the questions people already asked uh, about speech and voice? Why is it some days speech is clear and other days it is difficult to understand? You know, all of us fluctuate from day to day. And then when you have MSA, the MSA causes fluctuations, whether it's in speech or voice or overall physicality and performance day in and day out. Fatigue will definitely result in degradation of speech and voice. They get a better night's sleep, then things might be better tomorrow. Medications, uh, I would look for any obvious fluctuations in any medications they're on. If you see a pattern where things have dramatically changed, I would definitely reach out to their physician. Uh, but I would look for patterns in your own day-to-day -day life. What could be an explanation for why was today so much better? And yet on Sunday, they had such a hard time. Making a loud noise like a gasp when would normally take a quick intake of breath, is there a way to mitigate? So I alluded to this earlier when we talked about the impairment of the vocal folds potentially. Uh, if the noise itself does not concern me, the issue is whether or not this is actually interfering with breathing and something I did not mention, but sleeping. Um, you know, my area of expertise is not sleep, but we did talk about breathing and coughing. I would pay attention to, if you notice any of these features, is it interfering with sleep? Are they making more noise when they sleep versus during the day? That definitely should bring to the attention of your neurologist. Uh, the issue is, is this gasp occurring because there's just a lot of tension, like the person I alluded to who I met last week, who just has a lot of tension. Or is there a problem with the vocal folds? Is this a sign that the vocal folds are starting to weaken or aren't moving as freely as they used to before? 
The only way to know that is to see an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And so you would need a referral from your primary care or a neurologist to see the ear, nose, and throat doctor. In the meantime, there are two things you can try. One is breathing in through the nose. This only works if you're not congested. If you're congested and snotty, well, that's not going to work. But when you breathe in through the nose, there's a reflex that maximally opens the vocal folds. Hello, how are you? So I took a breath in through my nose. Hello, how are you? Does that mitigate the gasp? Number one, if you can't breathe through your nose, you can try breathing in through rounded lips, not, not a wide open mouth breath. The more open the mouth is, the wider breath you take in, actually the more tension it creates on the throat, the more drying and turbulent and irritating it is. And it also tends to be a really shallow breath. As strange as it seems, when you round the lips, I don't mean so tight that you can't breathe, but when it's rounded like with a, like with a smoothie straw or those bubble tea drinks, uh, which I've never had, but if you round the lips, actually by narrowing the lips, it helps the throat muscles relax. So I would try one of two things, in through the nose, in through rounded lips. Based upon a scope, the vocal folds of uh, have partial paresis. So paresis means that there's weakness, but there's still motion versus paralysis. Paralysis means they're not working. Is this why their voice is weak? So I can't tell that for sure. That's why their voice is weak. But if their vocal folds are in a position where they cannot close all the way, hello, or uh, if they can't close all the way, uh, then air escapes. And that does create weakness in the voice. At times they cannot be heard, is that due to the vocal fold paralysis? That very much could be the case. Again, it depends on the position of the vocal folds. If they can't close all the way, for you to make your voice loud, you know, hey, let's go. For me to make my voice loud, I need to be able to close my vocal folds all the way and keep them there. If there's a paresis or paralysis, then there's going to be difficulty doing so. Is it inevitable that voice will completely go in time? Uh, it's not inevitable, but it's common that there will that there is degradation in voice as well as speech, which is you know why we're having this conversation here today. How do I find a speech pathologist? A speech pathologist should be licensed in your state or your locale and certified by the American Speech Language Hearing Association. They should have experience in neurological disorders or neurodegenerative disease or Parkinson's disease, you may not find somebody who's had experience with atypical Parkinsonism, the progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal degeneration, multiple system atrophy. But if they've had experience with other neurological disorders like motor neuron disease, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, then they will have a familiarity with how things change over time and impacts to speech, voice and swallowing and cough. Uh, you can look for a movement disorder center uh, look for individuals who are members of the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society, and definitely ask your neurologist as well. You're welcome to reach out to me. Here's my email and my phone number. And as I mentioned, you don't have to be taking notes. Here is a QR code. It was at the start of the talk. Uh, for those of you who are chiming in later, you can take a picture of the QR code, and that is a copy of all these slides. So I'm going to take a moment. We're getting here to the, the end of our chat here today, but I'm going to answer some of the questions that were posted in the Q&A. Thank you so much. What treatment if there is abnormal movement of the vocal folds? Uh, so um, it depends on what you're asking. If you're looking for a treatment to make the vocal folds move, uh, that's not going to be possible. And it's because that the changes that have occurred in the brain that control the move, the changes because of the MSA uh, that cause the nerves to not to work properly that interfere with how the vocal folds move. If you are talking about treatment for the changes, the symptoms that occur because of the change in movement, so trouble with swallowing, trouble with cough or trouble with voice, then you can see a speech pathologist and they should be able to help you with some of the things that we talked about today to make speech clearer, to make voice stronger, to help enhance airway protection. If the time comes when the patient needs a feeding tube, who makes the decision? Well, ultimately the physician is up to the person who has MSA and their care partners. 
the physician, your neurologist, your primary care physician, whoever is really central to your care should be a part of that discussion because they should be able to answer your questions, address any concerns that you may have. But um, as I mentioned, the goal is, well, my goal, I realize that may not be your goal, okay? My goal is for you to have that conversation sooner rather than later because there may be a point where it's a crisis situation and that decision is no longer yours to make because things have escalated and you're in the emergency room or in the hospital and, and people then, because you're not able to speak for yourself, people then start to make decisions for you. So if you have an opinion, you need to express that to your family caregivers. If you have questions, you need to raise those questions and make sure that people are on board. They don't have to agree with you, but that they're on board and are aware of what your personal goals are. Uh, is it possible to have swallowing and speaking issues come and go? In general, so it depends on what you're asking there. So yes, you, we, you can have better days and worse days, but the overall trend would be towards more difficulty. And you may have better and worse days because of some of the other things we talked about, you know, related to fatigue or the amount of physical activity, uh, the amount of, uh, you know, sleepiness and attentiveness. There, there are a number of variables that go into play. Uh, you may have better motor days where you're just moving around more effectively and then other days where you're kind of, uh, you know, sort of bogged down. Could you please speak to vocal fold augmentation? So vocal fold, I will speak to this briefly because uh, this is actually a lengthier conversation, but vocal fold augmentation is when, so you have two vocal folds. Vocal fold augmentation is when material is injected, injected into the vocal fold by an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And it's almost always a laryngologist. A laryngologist is an ear, nose, and throat doctor who specializes in voice and vocal folds. Uh, I intentionally said material because there are a number of different materials that are used. It depends on physician preference, uh, what the circumstance is at the moment. Uh, and uh, it's augmenting the vocal fold. So they are injecting material. So if your vocal folds are, are actually like this, but so you can see it on the screen. If the vocal folds are positioned like this, then they inject to push. They inject to make the vocal fold bulkier or chubbier or plumper so that they meet toward the midline. For those of you who have asked about weak voice and you think, oh, well, that sounds like a good idea. Like oh, we'll push those vocal folds over a little closer together. Uh, this can be done in the outpatient clinic or the operating room. However, there is a significant, significant concern with persons with MSA undergoing this procedure. I'm not saying it should not be done. I'm saying there should be real conversations about how does this impact breathing? Your vocal folds do three things. They close to produce voice. They close to provide airway protection and cough. They swing open so you can breathe. So if, if these vocal folds aren't so mobile to start with, and then you inject material to plump them up to close them more, there's very likely going to be a compromise to airway or compromise to breathing. So you should always ask, how will this affect my breathing? How will this affect my swallowing? How will this affect my voice? How would you help someone who has strider and has difficulty breathing? So the first thing I would say is you need to see an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Somebody needs to look at the airway to see why are they having trouble breathing? Is it a problem in the throat or is it a problem with the lungs? And I started with the ENT doctor versus the pulmonologist just because you talked about strider. So again, strider is noise from the vocal folds because the vocal folds are closing as you breathe in. So that suggests to me that there's some sort of obstruction that the vocal folds, it should be not, you can see I'm doing the opposite there. Okay, so I would see an ear, nose and throat doctor first. And then I did give you those couple of quick tips earlier, but that doesn't make them move better. It just sort of helps airflow better about the breaths in through the nose or the breaths in through the rounded lips. Okay, I think I got, oh, here.
So here's a question. Uh, are there actual MSA specialists who he can see? Uh, we, have a not, we have a neurologist who concentrates on movement disorders. So yes, I'm gonna back up on the slides or not. There we go. Uh, yes, there are movement disorder specialists and they may or may not be at a movement disorder center. So you can look for you can look for movement disorder center, uh, and even if they're not a movement disorder center, there are movement disorder specialists. Uh, there is value. I, I think most people would agree there is value in seeing a neurologist who is a movement disorder specialist, and the reason is is because they will have seen many more persons with Parkinson's disease and these atypical Parkinson syndromes, such as multi-system atrophy. Um, and you can look for those on the internet. You can ask your neurologist if you feel like you need another opinion, it is in, within your right to request a second opinion and, be, and ask them for a resource or a recommendation to a movement disorder center or a movement disorders specialist. Okay, that brings us to the end and we're a little bit over time. Uh, again, I'm putting up the QR code here for the slides that I shared. It was a real pleasure to speak with you today. I know we covered a lot and then maybe in some regards you feel like, well, there's so much more to cover, but I at least wanted to give you a place to start uh, and some things to think about. You have the slides as a resource. If you have uh, any other comments or questions, uh, I provided my email address there at the end and my phone number, you're always welcome to reach out. Uh, I wish you all well, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, and I'm thankful to the MSA Coalition for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Have a good, have a good day.